Okay, so in this lecture, we'll be talking about you need dissolution or a better way to think about it is breakup or divorce um, and then repartnering. A lot of the um, designs on the slide are kind of sad. This isn't necessarily a sad topic, um, but it was kind of what I could find that best fit the theme. Anyway, moving on. So we'll be talking about how children experience their parents' um, union dissolution, um, factors that influence union dissolution, and then step families. All right, so some quick background. So union dissolution is a legal ending of a marital union and or, well, or a um, informal ending of a cohabitating union. So it's kind of just a fancy way of saying breakup um, legally or informally. Um, union repartnering is the formation of a new union and that can be either through marriage or again, through more of a informal cohabitating relationship. All right, so there have been a few different influences on the rate of union dissolution over the years. As individualism rises in the US, there has been an emphasis on relationships needing to be more personally fulfilling. So when people find themselves unfulfilled in their role as a partner, or they're not satisfied with their relationship, they may be more likely to end their relationship. And as we learned earlier in the semester from our sliding versus deciding article, couples who cohabitate may be at an increased race, risk of union dissolution. And that can be a major factor for why certain couples, specifically younger adults, end up breaking up. Men and women's employment also, or their opportunities also influence the relationship market. So men are often culturally expected to work in order to be considered a good partner. Unfortunately though, employment opportunities for men, specifically men without college degrees have been declining over the past several decades. As a result, men without a college degree are less likely to marry and are more likely to enter cohabitating unions with their partner. Unless their financial opportunities improve or um, their cohabitating relationships are more likely to end um, because they typically don't get married. Um, and we know that from that Eden article from earlier this semester. As for women's appointment, their financial opportunities can have two effects. So first there's the independent effect which allows women to be more selective about their partners because they don't have to solely rely on their partners uh, for income. Um, and then the other effect, sorry, I feel like I'm about to sneeze. The other effect is the income effect, which decreases the likelihood of dissolution since a woman's income allows her to decrease the financial stress in the relationship, which may increase the overall relationship satisfaction because that's one potential area of conflict kind of taken out of the equation. The age of entry into a union also influences the likelihood of union dissolution. So for those who are entering relationships, particularly marriage and cohabitating unions at a young age, they are more likely to end their relationship. Um, some say that it's because of maturity, who knows. Um, however, when people are older and they marry in their early 30s, typically um, the rate of divorce or dissolution tends to decline. African-American couples are at a particularly high risk um, of separation and divorce when compared to other racial ethnic groups. So some theorize that those who rely heavily, um, specifically um, within this racial ethnic group, um, they tend to rely heavily on kin and have um, less of a reason as a result to stay married uh, with a partner because, because they have that familial support. So they don't, they have a village to help kind of uh, raise any children that they have and they have support systems that will help them kind of leave a relationship um, which may lead to them being more open uh, to any relationships that's just one kind of idea all right um now let's kind of discuss the legal ramifications of union dissolution if the couple shares a child together so oftentimes the couple will have to sort out a uh, custody um to kind of figure out what their life is going to look like moving forward. Legal custody refers to having the right to make important decisions about the child and having legal responsibility for them. Joint legal custody means that both parents have an equal right to make important decisions concerning the child. Physical custody refers to the right um, uh, 
to the right to have someone's child live with them. And then joint physical custody means that the child spends time in both households um, and how that is divvied up kind of depends on the court and the specific family needs. Um, and those can vary greatly. Sometimes, um, you know, uh, kids will live every other week with a parent or um, one of my friends growing up, she was at her mom's Sunday through Wednesday and then at her dad's Wednesday through Saturday. So it was like kind of a 50-50. Um, and then sometimes um, parents will, the custody will be that the kid lives with one parent through the weekday and then on the weekends goes with another parent. But again, it kind of varies based off the situation. In the past, women were often rewarded full custody, um, and both legal and physical custody of their children. Um, and then fathers would often have to pay some kind of child support. But today, um, most parents are given joint custody of some kind. Uh, that's where kind of the legal system is moving towards and the research supports that this is kind of a better option for kids to have kind of joint custody if it's safe and by um, a possibility for the family. All right, so let's talk about non-resident fathers um, and how fathers kind of play a role in um, child custody. So non-resident fathers are fathers who do not live with their children um, and the amount of time that they spend with their child depends on the relationship often with the mother, both before and after the breakup. For the most part, non-resident fathers can be divided into three types of groups. So there's uninvolved, meaning that they neither see their child at all uh, and they don't pay any kind of child support. Um, involved fathers um, tend to see their children regularly, um, whether that's weekends or they have regular like planned days with their kids um, and they often also pay some kind of child support and then somewhat involved fathers are those who for, they see their children but they don't see them very frequently so they might see them like maybe once a month um, with involved fathers they typically are seeing them weekly for someone involved maybe it's once a month maybe it's every other month but they do see their children um, throughout the year um, and they pay or they can pay like some form of child support, but maybe not all of it. Um, oftentimes fathers start out as being very involved, uh, but over time decrease contact with their children for a variety of reasons. If you're interested in learning more about non-resident fathers and how, um, how they kind of understand what it means to be a dad, I would recommend reading Gen Dr. Jennifer Randall's book um, titled Essential Dads. Um, it covers low-income dads, um, and how they kind of understand child custody and what it means to be a dad in general. Um, moving on though, when non-resident fathers lose or decrease contact with their children, oftentimes their economic support through child, um, oh my gosh, I'm totally blanking on that word, um, child support payments um, often decreases as well. So only about 45% of child support payments are made um, in regards to every like child support case there is um, and made consistently in most cases. Um, within those 45% of those cases where child support is being paid and then paid consistently, only 20% of those um, families receive the full amount of child support that was due to them. Um, there's kind of, there's, uh, it's a complicated history with child support and child support laws. Um, but right now, the research is trying to see if there's a better way to go about um, paying child support. So I mentioned Dr. Jennifer Randall's book, Essential Dads, in her, the book that the men she talks to talk about the struggle of paying child support, especially for low income dads. There's also oftentimes, conflict between parents about how child support is being spent. So sometimes what will happen is, um, sometimes not all dads, but some dads may see um, the mother of their child buying like a nice purse or getting new clothes for herself or getting her nails done or things like that. Um, and there's kind of this narrative that like, oh, she's using my money for my kid to, um, 
spend money on herself like she's not using it towards the kid and then there's in her book Dr. Randall's kind of mentions this debate of like well she's just spending her money she's buying all these things for herself like that money should be going towards my kids and she sits down with these dads and she's like well she probably is using that money for your child but she has more of her own money now because you gave economic support to spend and treat herself a little bit nicer. Um, because without that economic support, 100% of her paycheck is going towards caring for your child. And so when you choose not to pay child support, um, she's having to use 100% of that paycheck. And so she's not able to buy those things without your support. But because you're caring for your child and she's able to use your money towards y'all's child, She's able to do nicer things for herself. Um, and that's kind of like a cognitive dissonance that some of the dads in her book kind of struggle with. Um, so as a result, to kind of end this debate of you're using my child support money to buy things for yourself kind of debate that parents tend to have, um, there is a push towards doing child support um, that isn't just garnering money from the father's paycheck, but instead having the father actively purchase things for his child and give them to maybe the mother who has most of the physical custody. Um, so this can be things like the dad has to bring diapers or the dad has to buy, um, goes with his child to buy um, school supplies or things like that. So he can actually see, okay, this is where my child support money is going and it kind of creates a better bond between the child and the father because the child can see how the father is caring for them. They can maybe do it together as a joint activity if that's safe for them to do, um, and things like that. So that's kind of a potential, that's a debate in policy right now and in the research. Um, it's really interesting. Again, if you want to learn more about this, I would definitely recommend reading Essential Dads. Um, it's a really interesting book. Um, it's very much research-based, but it's really fascinating. Um, I'm using it in my dissertation or referencing a lot in my dis dissertation. Um, anyway, moving on, <laughs> most custodial mothers take a huge economic hit, obviously, when they leave their relationship with the father, that's someone who's not able to help out with rent or bills or things like that, they might be able to help out with the child, but again, we're seeing that uh, dads tend not to pay their child support, so again, kind of the economic cost of raising a child is left to the mother most of the times. Um, and most single parent households are headed by women, but there is a growing number of men who are becoming full-time single dads. All right, so after a divorce or breakup between parents, children experience obviously major life changes and transitions. Um, for many families, they enter into what's called a crisis period, uh, which is the, typically occurs within the first two years after a separation into which the family as a whole struggles with the adjustment. Oftentimes parents are pretty angry with one another um, and are struggling with the transition, which leads to what's called diminished parenting. Uh, parents may seem emotionally distant, preoccupied, um, and either ignore misbehaviors from their child or give really harsh punishments for their child's misbehaviors. These difficulties can continue after the first two years if the parents continue to have high levels of conflict in a poor co-parenting relationship. Another reason why the first two years is considered a crisis period is that children experience major transitions through this time. Oftentimes they may have to move. They may have to move out of the home that they've been growing up in their whole lives or switch schools. Um, and their sta standard of living can significantly decrease if one parent is no longer supporting the family financially, whether that's through uh, specifically through child support payments. After the two year period, the children may experience another transition if their parents repartner. However, transitioning into, into a two parent household um, or it's two parent step family is less jarring for children than the transition out of a two parent household. After this crisis, crisis period, uh, children tend to resume normal development and very few children develop long term problems after um, their parents do divorce. Uh, for those few that do experience long-term problems, they are often less engaged, report more tension with their parents, and may display more anxiety and depression. And this kind of depends on the age that the divorce occurs. So for children whose parents divorced in like adolescence, they tend to have a couple, they tend to have a harder transition period. 
um, after the divorce. Children of divorce um, may be more at risk for a divorce than other adults. Some argue that this may be due to the fact that they may not know what a successful marriage looks like um, or have a good model for it. But again, the finding for that isn't largely supported. There's actually a lot of other variables that be, could be a factor into that, not just whether their parents got divorced or not. Um, so take that finding with a grain of salt. Some people kind of use, one of my friends, like use that as a reason for why maybe she would divorce her spouse. And I was like, we shouldn't go in with that mindset. So take that with a grain of salt. Um, oftentimes these negative outcomes are due to the partners having, or the parents in particular, having just a poor romantic relationship and that leading to them obviously getting divorced. But then even after that, divorce or that breakup, having a really poor co-parenting co relationship with high levels of conflict throughout the child's life. When parents have good co-parenting relationships with one another and cooperate with one another, children have really great outcomes and we don't see these negative outcomes that we would expect in children. So the key um, for helping children kind of transition through this period of time is to have really positive as much as you can co-parenting relationships or to at least be cordial and also never speak bad about the parent, the other parent in front of your child. Um, that can be really helpful. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of psychological effects of children. Let's talk about repartnering. So after relationship dissolution, a majority of families will create step families and potentially create blended families where there may be stepchildren or half siblings, things like that. Um, or family members like that, I should say. Um, however, step families may differ today. Um, the broad definition of a step family is a family that has two adults who are married or cohabitating, and at least one adult has a child from a previous relationship, but obviously both adults can have children from a previous relationship. So the first type of step family that we can see is cohabitating step families, which is defined as a step family in which the partners um, are cohabitating but not married. Um, and married step families, which means the partners are married. Today, most step families start as cohabitating step families and move towards married step families. Today, step families are incredibly co common in um, US families. In fact, 42% of American adults stated that they had at least one step relative, whether that was a half sibling, step sibling, step parent, or a step child. Finding a new partner could increase the family's economic assets, raise the family's standard of living, and provide extra child care. However, children and step families show lower levels of well being when compared to children in two biological parent families. So there may not be a clear positive outcome to being in a step family, but also there haven't been studies to show that being in a step family has like really long-term negative impacts either. Um, children who are living in cohabitating families or step families are at an increased risk for negative outcomes though, as they are more likely to engage in antisocial behaviors. There are a few reasons for why this could be. First, there's different levels of commitment and involvement among cohabitating step parents, since they don't necessarily have that clear parental role with the child. And second, many cohabitating partnerships tend to be short term, so children may not want to invest in their step parent or their relationship with their step parent and vice versa. There's also some boundary ambiguity, ambiguity, especially since there is no legal or marital ceremony that solidified them into the family. It's just kind of, they're there um, and maybe they're a big part of the life, but again, there's no, there's no binding situation that involved them into the family. Boundary ambiguity can continue even on into later years and even after um, the partners get married. Oftentimes, family members tend to provide less assistance for step relatives than for biological relatives. We talked about this a little bit when we talked about older families or older people in, old, um, in their families. After a step family is dissolved, the amount of contact between the adult stepchildren and step parent tends to decline or is non-existent. Over the past several decades, um, the divorce rate has risen in the U.S. and only until recently has started to decline. Some argue that the main driver for instability in relationships is the rise of cohabitation and 
as they can create like instability and boundary ambiguity among family members. Children living with parents in cohabitating unions are more likely to experience multiple familial transitions and instability. As a result, step families are more common than ever, which has added to the number of kinship ties a family will experience and the transitions a child can experience as well. But again, these bonds are sometimes weak. So when we look at how these transitions affect children, there may be initial challenges um, and growing pains, that might be a good word for it, but overall there are many, minimal long-term consequences to these changing definitions of family, both through disillusion and repartnering. So that's kind of our last lecture. Right.